thank you so much for joining us for Impact State of Mind. I'm Jaffa Parmigiani, co-founder and CEO of Impact Hub New York Metropolitan Area. Impact Hub New York Metropolitan Area is a nonprofit supporting entrepreneurs and change makers through programs designed to have uh, help <laughs> impactful ideas take off. We work broadly across the New York Metropolitan Area, but we also focus on Manhattan, Queens, Newark, and Morristown, New Jersey. Impact Hub is a global association of entrepreneurial communities in more than 100 cities and more than 50 countries around the world. Uh, Impact State of Mind is a virtual series created to support the social in, uh, innovation community during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so thank you so much for joining today's uh, session, which was uh, brought to us by popular demand of our members uh, for the topic of impact funding for social entrepreneurs during COVID-19. I'm really excited to hand the baton to Simone Tarantino, who is going to be moderating the session. He has more than 25 years of entrepreneurial and business experience. Uh, he is a lead mentor for ERA, Global Accelerator in New York, a uh, consultant for the Italian Trade Agency, and a senior advisor to many uh, international startups. Uh, Simone, it's a real pleasure and honor to have you on, and thank you so much for moderating this conversation. Oh, thank you so much, JP, for the nice intro. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, as I said, my name is Simone Tarantino, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, to add to what JP said, I'm also the founder of Startup Home, a venture that aggregates co-living, co-working, and creates uh, incubation hubs as a conduit to fostering entrepreneurship in secondary and tertiary cities, uh, and also a mentoring platform, impactmentors.co, both initiatives that are focused on underrepresented founders. Um, working with Startup Home and on some other project for the underserved and underrepresented part of this ecosystem, what I'm playing with, um, I witnessed firsthand the systemic problem that still today minorities are facing, especially when it comes to funding. Uh, I want to give you just a quick uh, overview of that landscape. In uh, the San Francisco area, uh, which we know, you know for startups is like the Gotha, uh, is, doing, uh, is the first when it comes to investing in minority founders. Uh, since 2015, they deployed about $4.6 billion, but that's only 1.8% of the total venture capital invested in the area. New York, where we are now, is doing a bit better, uh, um, deploying about five, a little more than 5% of the total venture funding to minority-owned uh, companies, but it's still very low. Uh, and just another last number I want to give you, based on a crunch pay research, so far in 2020, black and brown founders have raised $2.3 billion, which represent only 2.6% of the total funding uh, through August 2020. Just to give you a, 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 some benchmark, Fortnite, which, you know, the company, uh, total report equity funding, $3.4 billion. 1.5 just this August, you know, just to give things in, in perspective. So it's easy to derive that underrepresented community, black, brown, LGBTQ, women, immigrants, and more, what we, you know, we consider uh, minorities are really underserved, uh, especially when it comes to funding. Um, I will add more numbers uh, in, in context later. Uh, now I want to introduce our, our panelists for, for uh, this evening. Um, well, welcome to Rashmi Panzi, the VP of City Impact Investing, uh, working for City Impact Fund, a $150 million venture capital fund that invests in US-based uh, startups, mainly in four sec uh, sectors, sustainability, workforce development, financial capability, and physical and social uh, infrastructure. So um, we also have uh, with us Melissa Bradley, which she is the co-founder of Eureka, a venture-backed uh, baked a community where small business gain access to expertise they needed uh, to grow their businesses. And she's also a partner of 8063 uh, Ventures. Uh, last but not least, uh, Erica Ball. Uh, she's the executive director of the David Prize, which uh, celebrates and funds extraordinary individuals with idea, project, products, and passion that are making New York City a better place. So thank you all uh, uh, to be with us uh, this evening. And uh, the first question is for 
uh, uh, Rashmi. Uh, Rashmi, the City Impact Fund, I believe, was launched in 2020, uh, has a mission of investing in women and minority, minority entrepreneurs. Uh, can you tell us uh, how it started at City and what's your role in it? Sure, thanks. Um, so we launched the City Impact Fund in January um, before the world completely changed. And um, it was $150 million then. It's actually now grown to $200 million, which I can talk a little bit more about. Um, I think, you know, City has been um, very strong on corporate citizenship and social responsibility over the last several years. And we have a corporate foundation, and we also are very involved in sustainability and in financing green business. Um, the Impact Fund, I think, was an idea that was talked about for several years internally. Um, and I think, you know, this year we were lucky to have the opportunity to make it happen. Um, in the last, I think, it, it, I have no sense of time anymore, but in the last month or so, I believe, uh, City came out with an announcement um, to advance racial equity. And that is through both our businesses as well as our philanthropic efforts. And so the City Impact Fund has another $50 million bringing the total to $200 million. And this new 50 million will be to fund black entrepreneurs exclusively. Um, and it could be in any sector, not just the four that you mentioned, um, as long as the businesses are venture backable and scalable, which I'm sure we'll talk about. That is, that is really, really uh, interesting, especially uh, uh, the plus 50, uh, which is always, you know, a good sign uh, uh, for, you know, you know, for the ecosystem. Uh, um, with that, Melissa, you have a long history of being very active in promoting and supporting minority led business, uh, both with uh, 863 Ventures, with, uh, which accelerate new majority entrepreneurs and with your new ventures, uh, uh, Eureka. Can you tell us a bit more about what you mean with new majority and how are you bridging entrepreneurship and racial equality? Sure. So thank you again for having me. Um, I think there's a couple of things. So one, as a person of color who has been an entrepreneur for a very long time, um, it has been exciting to see a lot of these announcements um, and I would say a very long time coming. And I hope that people do not equate the massive amounts of funding that are entering the market with some new boom, because there has been a history of entrepreneurship and what I call new majority entrepreneurs. Right now, we know statistically that black women are the fastest growing entrepreneurs and Latinx businesses are the fastest growing businesses. And therefore, and we've seen a 40% decline amongst white males starting new businesses. So the frame is, is not new, it just reflects where the massive increase over the past, I'd say five to seven years has existed within entrepreneurship. A lot of that has been driven by necessity due to the core socioeconomic factors that exist. I think a lot more is gonna be due to COVID-19 and the impact and high rates of unemployment. We already see statistically that entrepreneurship is on the rise. And I think culturally it has always been a core part, let me just speak for the black culture, a core part of African-American communities to have entrepreneurship. So I have been operating within this frame that the most likely, the fastest growing and those that are starting business the fastest tend to be people of color but they're also those that have been historically underinvested in. And so the work that I've done has been twofold. With 1863 Ventures, there's been a, a content piece, a community piece and a capital piece. And undergirding that has been research that says it costs a quarter of a million dollars more for an African-American entrepreneur to start the same exact business as their white peer. Some of that is because there's not a connection to a community and, and the same type of social capital. Uh, so at 1863, we have spent now five years running what would some say very traditional accelerator programs with a real commitment on building community amongst the founders and amongst our cohorts and a focus on job creation because we believe that is the multiplier effect that will actually change conditions long-term. And we've so far luckily to date served over 4,000 entrepreneurs and we average about 600 or so per year. Recognizing though that that was such a small part of the larger market opportunity was an opportunity then to create Eureka, which is a platform business, a tech platform with an app that literally takes what we were doing in 1863 to scale. So we believe that because of places like City, where there is now money dedicated, we are then, that's kind of the supply side, we are the demand side in saying, how do we help train up how do we help skill up and how do we help prepare investment ready businesses to receive a lot of this money that has been long time coming, but we're glad is here. That, that, that is, that is amazing. And 
I will I will go to the uh, 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 women entrepreneurs and and the specific of the data that you 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 told us you know a little later in in a specific question. Uh, I wanna go to Erica um, because what Erica is doing is is a bit more horizontal, a little bit more uh, uh, narrow to the New York area. Uh, because with the David Prize, she focuses on people in New York area giving an actual monetary prize to deserving individuals. Um, you know, can you tell us why the prize was created uh, and why you feel that uh, uh, you're investing in making New York a better place? Yeah, thanks so much for, for holding this. And I think funding is such an important question for for so much of the city and so much of the country right now, there's so much conversation around the PPP loans and who it got to and who they didn't go to. And so I think this is really important to talk about what other funding sources are trying to find folks that are traditionally cut out of systems, um, whether invisibly or very explicitly. So thank you to Impact Hub for holding this um, and to Rashmi and Melissa. Um, so the David Prize is really straightforward. It's so it's so simple in its ethos and in its values. The whole point is to invest in individuals in New York City. That is our only criteria. That it's specific to New York City, um, and it's looking for people who have brilliant ideas that can change the city. That's it. It can be for one city block. It can be all eight million of us. The thesis is really around investing in individuals and the belief that a person can change a company, a city, a country at scale. I think we're realizing the impact of that right now, given this moment in time as we look to next week. And ultimately, it's really about taking bets on people who can do extraordinary things. So we are sector agnostic. Um, we don't care about the growth trajectory. It is no strings attached funding. We award winners, five New Yorkers each year with $200,000, no strings attached. And the method to the madness is to free up the mental and emotional bandwidth for folks to do what they ought to be doing in the world, in society, for communities, um, that the collective shouldn't suffer because they don't get the chance. And the David Prize is really trying to bet on those folks who should have the chance, but otherwise are going to fly under the radar. Um, and I think unique to the David Prize, as I said, we don't maximize for economic returns. We don't take a board seat. It's non-dilutive capital. Um, but it also is non-dilutive in mental space. We don't ask for impact metrics. We're not looking for two-year impact outcome returns, whatever the jargon is these days. Um, we're really trying to just invest in people who, in the long run, we think can make incredible contributions to New York City. Um, and for that reason, we cast a really, really wide net. It's an open call. And we actually mean that, regardless of immigration status, regardless of your background. Anybody can just pick up their smartphone, um, go to the library and access our website, and be able to apply with their idea whatever the idea might be for New York City. A big part of what we're trying to do now, um, which is why I'm excited to learn from both Melissa and Rashmi is figure out how we can be a feeder to organizations like the work that you're doing, Melissa, to, you know, we ask the question, what's your dream? Um, but there's so much work that goes into the capacity building around that. And so having organizations, other institutions that are thinking about what support mechanisms are really key to help folks build those up is, is part of our work as well. So that's a little bit about the David Price. That that sounds like a lot of work on 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 your hand, uh, and a lot of work on you know uh, trying to understand the the longer dream and how that dream impacts uh, really New York. It's it's exceptional. Uh, I I, I want to use that uh, to to form like a, my my next question. So we're living in a, in a very difficult time. Uh, this pandemic is hurting the economy. Uh, and with that, the ability to grow for a lot of companies, small companies, big companies, individuals. So in, in the startup ecosystem uh, globally, two thirds of startups uh, uh, in a Forbes uh, April sur survey says they will run out of money within six months. Uh, and four out of 10 startups uh, that they, um, they call say that that will might happen in within three months entering you know in that what's called the, the red zone so i i want to understand 
a little more uh, um, from Melissa and Rashmi and, and Erica too on, on, on some extent, how that has changed the way uh, uh, venture capital and organizations are deploying capital, especially impact capital to you know, the, uh, the ecosystem. So, so I'll start, I'll, I'll give a, a, an example because I think we're seeing in a couple different ways. In, on the Eureka side, we have been privileged to be able to move $100 million in four months to over 15,000 entrepreneurs of color. And that has been because Facebook, Salesforce, WeWork, and Google um, all realize what Erica has known for a while probably, which is non-dilutive capital can be really catalytic for entrepreneurs who are historically marginalized from mainstream systems. And those dollars were deployed, no strings attached, um, but it also came with program support. So they had a chance to not just use the money any way they wanted, uh, well, anyway, but, but with some guidance around how did they want to be able to move and grow their business during this very unique time. So for some of them, it was improving their social media presence. Some of it was connecting and improving their e-commerce platform. So there was a direct correlation and, and free coaching and mentoring that helped them advance that. And we'll be tracking those entrepreneurs over the next year. So I think that there's one, a lot of grant money that is floating around out there that we should be mindful is highly opportunistic and that's okay, uh, but we need to take advantage of it. Um, there are a few more programs that we know of coming online, but really just be on the lookout. I would also say this has probably created a unique moment in time that in 1863, uh, we're in the process of creating a fund uh, that is not a traditional venture capital fund. There'll be a portion of it that's equity uh, and then a portion of it that's revenue-based financing. We, we know that only about 20% of all Black entrepreneurs are tech-based entrepreneurs. And for many others, venture capital, while useful, <clears throat> can not be the most mission aligned. And so there's lots of alternatives, myself and Jewel and others, Jewel Burke, Solomon with Collab Capital. There's a lot of folks that are really coming into the scene. And I think we're able to leverage this moment of people, one, understanding that there has been a historical disinvestment in black and brown entrepreneurs, but their businesses are still going. So let's take a chance. And two, there's been a lot more money, not just in the investments that Rashmi is trying to do, but even at an LP level where folks are saying, hey, let me put some money in funds, right? We saw PayPal and a lot of others who had never been in the space before come in and say, let me think about this, which is important because unfortunately funds run by black and brown GPs are still not at the level to go to pension funds. So it's, it's been a nice buffer to say, let's get some traction. And, and the best news was that Keisha Cash now has Impact America Fund 2 at 50 million, which is clearly a success and in, in, in a very direct in the impact space. So I think there's been also not just money going down to the entrepreneurs in a non-dilutive way, but a re-examination by LPs of how they can stand up and support funds as that first line of offense to be able to help these entrepreneurs. So that's been a huge win for us. And, and hopefully there'll be some returns where that can, momentum will continue. Yeah, I'll just, I'll add, I mean, I think, you know, in the immediate response to the crisis, cities in me, reaction was really to fund CDFIs who are you know, really supporting entrepreneurs. And particularly we were looking at um, black and brown entrepreneurs in the country um, who need, had that immediate need for funding um, with the crisis. And so that, that is a whole nother you know, venue that we are involved with and is probably more essential to most business owners. Um, as Melissa mentioned, venture capital is there, but it is really um, not necessarily suitable for most entrepreneurs and not accessible to many entrepreneurs. And the City Impact Fund is still a venture capital fund. Um, we do have an impact lens, but you know we are looking for companies that are looking to build a billion dollar business in a few years. And most people are just trying to build a good solid business that grows you know, every year and employs a lot of people. Um, and that's just a different type of financing that's involved. So I think the efforts that Melissa and others are, are doing to you know, find new ways of funding um, entrepreneurs in that at, um, at a more at a level that meets what their need is is really important um, and I do agree um, Melissa I think you know we for us we're funding entrepreneurs at the seed stage that is still far beyond um, when a lot of entrepreneurs of color and women particularly need the funding um, they usually need it much earlier and so organizations like Erica's and like Melissa's are really crucial um, ones to support people in getting you know even before they get to someone like me um, to look at. And so that is really, I think, where the real need is as you know, policymakers and others are thinking about what to do. Um, and that, you know, that said, you know, the City Impact Fund we did launch in January. We have invest made a few investments. We have a few more coming. Um, but 
one thing that I, you know, and I'm a, I'm a little new to venture capital, but one thing that, you know, I learned was as soon as the crisis hit, the first priority of any fund is to um, make sure their existing portfolio companies are fine. So in the sense that other businesses need funding, that's really not the priority of a fund manager at that time. Um, luckily for us, we had not made any investments yet. So we could still focus on newer companies and, um, and we did make some investments. Um, but I think that, you know, that's not the norm. And so, um, I think that just for people who are thinking about entrepreneurship and ways to get funding to entrepreneurs, the, there's so many other types of funding out there that are way more immediate and way more accessible to folks, especially in a time of crisis. I would just comment on that too. I mean, I and and mine is more anecdotal because we don't we don't have a, a seven year eight year fund cycle that we're operating on, but it it felt both across the the types of capital philanthropic to more traditional venture that there was a retraction and more of a reaction to portfolio existing portfolio which makes sense that's where incentives align both on the philanthropic side right because you're still reporting on the growth of those nonprofit ventures and the growth um, of how many folks are impacted in whatever whatever sector in which they're operating the same with venture capital so the incentives make sense make sense um, but I also think I, you know, I, I, I wondered, kind of given the double down on portfolio of existing hypotheses, what was missed? And instead of being, instead of just being reactive, um, there, there was less of an opportunity to be proactive and think about what are the other types of organizations that have always historically been left out of our criteria that are actually closer to the social capital networks where if we're going to do mutual aid, if we're going to do rapid response, if we're going to do um, whatever it might be, any B2C play um, for new customer segments, I wonder if there was uh, unique value missed there because some of these, again, companies or organizations that are closer, have stronger social capital, may be left out of kind of the traditional funding streams. Um, so I, I kind of uh, totally agree with you, Rashmi. That's similar to what I had been hearing anecdotally. That, that is, that is uh, true, Eric and Rashmi, and, and, and also Melissa, what you just said, you know, uh, it's, it's probably one of the problems that the ecosystem is leaving you know, this year that uh, uh, capital is being reactive uh, and non-proactive. Uh, uh, so in, a, in an ecosystem that already, uh, let's call it underserved, you know, uh, a community, that community is now uh, underserved twice, okay? Because the capital is not deployed in the first place and then is not deployed for a secondary reason. Uh, but, and I wanna dig a little more in, into uh, uh, deploying capital. Uh, um, since 2015, over $15 billion has been raised by minority founders, which as we said, is about 2.5% of the total VC. 2.5% is a fraction of what should and could be have deployed. So what is, we know there's a problem. You know, we're here talking about this because we know there's a problem. So where is it? Is the access to capital? I'm being a little, you know, uh, pushy here. Is access to capital or is the VC community mentality towards minority funders the obstacle? Which one it is? And I'm throwing the question to all of you. I appreciate the devil's advocate perspective. Um, so, so I'm going to answer it. Uh, I'm gonna answer it as an entrepreneur. So Eureka is a venture backed company. So November of last year, we launched and we raised 8 million plus dollars. Um, and here I was a black woman in Silicon Valley with my co-founders. And I would say that there was um, healthy skepticism. Uh, there was bias, <laughs> there was racism, uh, you name it. And, and I think for us, it was twofold to be brutally honest, it was one, I'm not the normal person that pitches. Uh, and two, there was an intentionality of our community to focus on women and entrepreneurs of color. And so we had a double-edged sword, so to speak. But I would say that probably with more meetings, so more time spent with us, which luckily we got, uh, and a lot more ownership of data 
they saw the value proposition. But they were very clear this was not their normal investment. This was a, a, a somewhat of a leap for them, but they were trusting. And I would say, irrespective of race and gender, we had no precedent in front of us because most small business platforms had not achieved whatever they set out to achieve, in part because the small business community is extremely disaggregated. And so I would say they were open, but there was a, 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 almost a Sisyphus type effort that had to be undertaken. Um, and I would say, but on the flip side though, I would also argue, so I'd say, yes, we experienced all the things we expected and, and not surprising why there's less than 2%. On the flip side though, let me put on my accelerator and Eureka hat and, and maybe Rashmi can share some of hers. There are a lot of entrepreneurs who are not ready. Let me just be brutally honest. And, and that um, despite the 20 million programs that somebody can enroll in, uh, and be told how to raise money. It is so not about the pitch deck and it is so not about your three minute pitch. And luckily having raised money before um, and having been to venture capitals before, I can share that with entrepreneurs, but we have to own that most entrepreneurs don't have the right information. They're operating on imperfect data that is a performance to pitch your business to a venture capitalist when indeed it is a conversation. And dare I push it even further to say, most entrepreneurs, irrespective of race and gender, are not prepared for that conversation. Because it is about, to Rashmi's point, how are you gonna scale? Which means you actually have to know your customer pretty well, and you have to know the metrics that you should be tracking. Then you wanna layer impact on top of that. So I think, yes, there is some systematic challenges because being a black woman is an automatic risk and a checkbox that LPs have to reconcile with. And I think my co-founders in this case helped balance some of that and the fact that we actually had tried some of it and we had already put some skin in the game that we had some results. On the flip side though, I challenge anyone on this phone along with myself who's running programs for entrepreneurs that you step up and understand what it takes to get Rashmi to take their phone call. And then more importantly, what does it take for Rashmi to give them a return phone call? Because Rashmi is awesome. She's probably talking to everybody, bless her soul. But the reality is how to get past Rashmi up to her investment committee and fit into a larger portfolio. I do think that entrepreneurs are not being well served by a lot of programs out there that are making this a quick pitch. You got the deck, give me some animation and be sexy. And that is so not what a venture capitalist is looking for when they're trying to create the right portfolio mix. Melissa is spot on. And I think, you know, you, Simone, your, your question about where the problem is, I think it's everywhere. Um, you know, it is, it is, there's obviously bias among the investor community. Um, and, you know, I kind of see it every day. And a lot of times people aren't aware they have it. Um, but sometimes it's honestly explicit as well. Um, sometimes it's a factor of who's in the room. So even if, you know, someone like me or, you know, I was so excited to hear about Keisha's announcement today, um, there's not a lot of us in the room um, to actually, um, you know, advocate for folks who actually have great businesses. And, you know, I'll be really honest, there's not a lot of people with different lived experiences of just what most people in the economy face as well in the room. So I'll give you an example. I'm working, I'm, I'm leading our efforts on workforce development. And one of the challenges I'm seeing is I want this to be an impact fund as well as generate returns. I wanna see some benefit to communities. So I'd like for us to focus on the, the almost half of the adult workforce that is earning low wages and is, is really suffering during this crisis. And I don't wanna call them low skilled because in fact, their skills are what's keeping everybody else going during this time. Um, yet they are also not invested in by their employers or by society in general. However, as I'm looking at venture back pitches um, or you know scalable pitches, um, a lot of the companies that I think are helping this group of people are funded by government. The amount of time it takes to get a government contract is really long. And so my investment committee, you know, who are traditionally looking at just what's a good investment, what's a good return, are going to say, you know, that's just going to take too long. Do we really want to tire up our capital that way? Everyone is really into the spirit of the fund. Um, so it's not like I'm having political battles with folks, but it is their job to assess risk and return. And, you know, that's where some of the great business ideas that I think are great are not really you know, getting through. And it's hard to communicate that. I will also echo Melissa's point. Um, a lot of people will come and think their business is ready for venture capital and it's not. It's going to be an amazing business, right? So a lot of this is also, as you said, Melissa, you know, the community is a bit disaggregated. People don't know where to go for the right advice and right information and right access. And so it's very easy to get discouraged. Um, and 
you know, trying to get me on the phone, like I need like a hundred more of me, I think is, is really the solution. And so, you know, it gets back to, I mean, part of these, all these corporate announcements are not just about money, but about also diversifying staff on these funds, investing in LPs who I think are addressing the funding gap much earlier, who are members of different communities and know who's, you know, who's backable as well. Um, but there's also a huge amount of subjectivity, right? So when I'm, we're looking at an impact fund, but I'm looking at it from city's eyes. And so what might be totally impactful, you know, Eric, as you mentioned, it could even help like a neighborhood in New York City and have a huge impact. It might not fit our definition of impact. And so that's a whole nother issue, which I'm not sure we can always define clearly to even help an entrepreneur assess whether we would fit. I mean, so many points in there. One, I love this idea of like everyone coming with a really beautiful pitch. Like that isn't the thing. It's not just a pitch. It's not just an elevator pitch. And we, through our diligence process, um, we really date each other, dare I say. Like, you know a lot about each other. And you should, you should know how you think, you should know all of the questions that you wanna be able to ask can be asked and vice versa. The power should be on both sides of the table. And I don't know if um, the funding side opens the door to that power dynamic enough where one, to your point, Rashmi, they're transparent about their criteria and what they're actually looking for. We struggle with this, we're new, and we're still dealing with how do we best earmark, define, make it really explicit. And we hear feedback for it. We run surveys with thousands of people that tell us their ideas to make sure that we can be as clear as possible with folks. Um, if you know what's not fundable, you should just say it up front. And I don't know if GPs do that enough. Um, I don't know if accelerators and prep programs teach entrepreneurs to ask it enough because of the power dynamic that sits at the table. Um, and and, I, and I, I, I think the power question for the GP side or for the funder side needs to be reckoned with. Like, you, sh you know, we should be taking the calls and showing up on time and like treating it just as, you, you, the, the conversation needs to be just as equal on both sides. And I think it's hard. The second thing that you said, Rashmi, that I thought was really interesting is, um, the subjectivity that comes into the value proper stickiness of products. There's always a conversation around, is it just my own lack of understanding of what works in this community? Yeah, it is, it is. So like try harder to understand it. And so I, I think both of those things come into play, but the, the problems are throughout the, the kind of capital structure. A, a lot of in incredible points here and a lot of food for, for thoughts. I wanna focus on, on a couple of them. Uh, uh, the first one, is uh, uh, related to what Melissa said about you know uh, um, the the community being uh, disaggregated, but most of all the fact that entrepreneurs are not ready, are not prepared, uh, uh, which I found it very common. You know, there's like, oh, I have a good idea, so I, w I you know people will listen to me. Um, so there's there's a also that like the reverse, and I, I again I, I like to to play a little devil's advocate. Um, so how us as a either venture community, mentor community, uh, a GP community, whatever uh, uh, type of, 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 of people we are, uh, how can we let them know? How can we help them understand how to access capital, but more importantly, how to access the resources that are available, the, the uh, learning components that are there uh, uh, to let them understand how to uh, start, move, and, and prepare to, you know, to then sit down in front of a, a, a VC. The first thing I would say is due diligence. Um, you know, I think what, one of the things that, the, the, I think it was Fast Company had this article where an African-American female entrepreneur said, I am underfunded and overcoached. Um, and I took that, right? But I also realized that part of that is we assume all programs are created equal and they're not. So I would say spend as much time as you can learning about the program, making sure it's a right fit and talking to other entrepreneurs who've been through the program. I think unfortunately, because many uh, entrepreneurs, particularly entrepreneurs of color are operating from a reactive mode and trying to seize opportunities, they're choosing programs where there's the greatest amount of money, but not the greatest amount of aligned support. And we've had many any entrepreneurs tell us that. So I think one is, you know, find a peer group of 
businesses you trust and are similar to yours and make sure um, because the one thing you can't get back is time. You know, we clearly in a world of venture capital where it's okay if you lose money, but it's really not okay if you lose your time. Um, I think the other piece is, is, you know, I use this analogy of a pillow and a mirror. Use a mirror and really assess what help you need. I do think that sometimes our entrepreneurs are not honest with themselves of where the gaps are. Um, and so when we do the interview questions at Agent 63, you know, one of them is, is where do you need help? And we're quick to say, that's awesome, but we can't help you. We're not the right one for you. And I think that unfortunately, the, the vicious uh, financial models of some of these programs is the more people I have, the more money I get, but doesn't mean you have the right people. So I do think it's important for entrepreneurs to really look in the mirror and say, what is the help I need right now? Not what is the help I need to get funded? What is the help I need right now to grow a business? Because I do think there are lots of programs that leapfrog people past some of the fundamentals of a startup, like understanding who your customer is and having a customer persona. And then all of a sudden they think, they need venture capital. So those are two things that I would say for entrepreneurs in particular, excuse me, of how they're investing their time. I would just add, you know, as, as the one who's looking at the pitches and, and the decks, um, I really try to be very upfront in, in respecting the entrepreneur's time, because if I'm not a good fit for them, I don't want them to like be chasing me when there's somebody else they should be looking to meet. And I'm always happy to make those introductions if I think there's somebody that I think would be better, you know, more of a help to them. Um, I think in the end, like, especially, you know, Erica, you mentioned the power dynamic. I think for investors, what, you know, we collectively need to do is really like, we're really busy, but entrepreneurs are even busier and they're the people that we're serving. And so we really need to be very mindful of their time. I also like, you know, I think the, the rule of thumb is like you, for every hundred pitches you see, there might be one that actually you would like take to the investment committee. So there's a lot, you gotta get good at rejecting people, but I think it's easier when you can hopefully point out somewhere else for them to go and really to actually give really good feedback. You know, um, I thought like, this is an interesting idea, but I'm not sure it'll scale, but you might wanna try talking to so-and-so um, because there's always gonna be something good about their idea or their enthusiasm. And I think that like, shouldn't be, you know, squashed. I think you're, you're definitely uh, spot on on, on that. Uh, I, I want to push you a little more, Rashmi uh, and, and Melissa, and also Erica, because uh, uh, Erica, you worked at Robinhood and the Global Development Incubator, so you do have, you know, the, the experience and, 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 and the knowledge of. Uh, um, again, the the ecosystem, the startup ecosystem, is 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 very diverse. It's very wide. It's big, uh, but. I still struggle to, uh, and maybe uh, what Melissa is doing with Eureka is is a definitely amazing step in the right direction. But I do still believe that the ecosystem needs uh, uh, more guidance. Uh, uh, it's very disaggregated, and uh, yes, there's a lot of incubators, a lot of accelerators, but uh, it's difficult for you know a, a young startup person. Uh, whomever it is, you know, minority or not, to uh, 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 having, you know, the, the minimal knowledge to understand where to go, who to ask. So uh, I, I want to, I wanna, again, push you on, on, on that direction to, to understand if we can give to our, our audience some pointers, at least, to, to look in the right direction. Yeah, so I mean, I, I appreciate the 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 support and, and I guess the, the kind of plug for Eureka. I mean, that's what it was designed to do, right? Eureka is not here to replace anybody's program. Um, it is designed to take the most expensive part of an accelerator program and bring it to scale. Accelerator programs work because they're in cohorts, right? And that's the business model that has been built around a cohort model. Once you leave that cohort and you've got a different question than the person across the way, it becomes really expensive to serve you. So Eureka is designed to provide community if you want it, but also to support folks as they've come out of a program. So we've been pretty intentional to say to accelerators, incubators, universities, if you have people in your waiting room and you can't take, we'll take them and we'll get them ready to come into your program. But if you have your graduates and you know they're almost ready and there's some individualized refinement, then those are the ones we really want. Um, because I think it does indeed take a continuum to get entrepreneurs ready. And there is that nuance around sector and geography and business model and team that is just really hard to deliver in, in a cohort model. So Eureka is designed that every person gets individual coach. They also get an individual mentor. If they want to be part of a group, they can. And then there's tons of programs that they can do DIY or they can be part of a, a quote unquote mastermind group. 
we do have to recognize that, that programs can only do so well because there is something unique about every single entrepreneur and, and how they're able to define their customer and their competitive advantage. And unfortunately, most of the models that I'm familiar with, also being a professor, it just doesn't happen. And there's not the business model to support this individualized attention. So I think to the extent that entrepreneurs out there want to join a platform or they want to find someone who's willing to coach them and mentor them, then they should do that. But I think what's happening to Rashmi and, and to Erica's point is we cannot presume that the investor is going to be that coach or that mentor. That is not their job. And I do think that people come a little ahead of schedule thinking, well, they'll help me. Well, well they might, but not as they're wearing their venture capital hat because that financial model doesn't allow for individualized assistance either. I think that's right. I think that's right. I think there, there's a really clear staffing structure that goes into 220 venture capital models. Um, if we're talking about VC and I, you know, I, but I, I think there is, there are small teams that deploy lots of money. That's like how, how it works. High volume, you look through due diligence, you invest in a few and you hope it's the right ones. Um, reg regardless of what you're optimizing for, but there are always things you're optimizing for. You hope you're taking the right bet. Um, you know, I think there, there's this, there's this idea that like the entrepreneur is going to find you always I, that's, that might be true, but it hasn't panned out well for the data that we're seeing. And so, you know, in addition to, um, perhaps not handholding all of the entrepreneurs or companies that you're excited about from a VC lens, I do think there's more work that needs to be done around like demonstrating what capital is available for who, and just making it transparent. Um, I'm sure there are like lots of databases out there that do this really well. Um, there are a couple of people I follow on Twitter who do this really well. But like, you know, I, I think there is some work from the eco from the funding side to make it clear around who this is for and and why. Again, and the and the note of transparency. That's that's spot on. Uh, Rashmi, you wanted to add something. Yeah. No, I just wanted to add. You know, I think there's also, um, you know, I've been particularly looking. Um, at the entrepreneurs of color and women who are, you know, looking for funding. And, and certainly I think there's data back to back this up. And I know Melissa will know the data off, um, right off the top of her head. But you know, what I find is that when I'm talking to an entrepreneur who's very accomplished and has a great idea, but because they've been unable to access the interim funding that they needed, they've either not quit their day job and are doing their business on their side, on the side, or they're like chasing different accelerator programs or different prize competitions as well to kind of get the non-dilutive funding. And because of that, they're not able to grow and scale at the kind of speed that a venture capitalist is looking for. So I've been in meetings where someone will say, well, this is a great idea, but why did you start this five years ago? Like what's been going on? And the issue is really that this person has been so busy trying to figure out where to go next um, and, and, you know, it hasn't had time to focus on their business. Um, and in the meantime, like you'll read about someone else who's, you know, not, not to be ageist, but who's like 21, who just got a ton of money without even any sort of product. And meanwhile, the others are really, you know, under pressure to generate revenues and therefore take away from the idea of scaling their product to be scalable. So it's, it's a really vicious circle. Um, and, you know, even like the folks that, you know, the accelerators like and that Melissa works with, they're doing great work. But the problem is, yes, it's the same founder going from one to another because there's just, it's difficult even for the accelerators to link them to the funders that they need right after. I have to share this one story. There was an entrepreneur who came through a, an 1863 accelerator last year and um, she applied. And so we interviewed everybody and she was like, I'm not really sure like if this is the right program. And I was like, Cool. You, you know, you decide. And we all ended up at SOCAP and she talked to one of our entrepreneurs and, and Rashmi knows who it is. And the woman took her aside and said, I'm not part of this conversation. She came back. She's like, I'm coming to your program. I was like, okay, great. She gets there day one. She's talking to people and she breaks out into tears. And I was like, what's the matter? And she said, I just want you to know that I have been on the road for one year in its entirety. I am happy to say I've raised almost $2 million but you are challenging me on management decisions. I haven't had a staff meeting in 18 months and my team is mad at me and says, I need to bring my butt back home. I don't share that to make fun of her, but I share to say that is the challenge, right? That there is not a luxury for entrepreneurs of color to get that capital, whether it's grant or venture, both of them allow you to do a lot of stuff like run a business. And, and what she found was this opportunity cost God bless her. Right now, she just closed a $3 million round without having to leave because for the past nine months, she has had head down running the 
company. But it was that initial funding. And that's just ridiculous. And that that should not be the norm. Right? That's not the American way, quote unquote, that we should be having entrepreneurs grow businesses at the opportunity cost and risk of failure of the actual reason they're out here, because there is such a disconnected patchwork of dollars that women in particular and women entrepreneurs of color in particular are stuck with having to try to raise. So that that's that's actually a, a very telling story, and uh, I, I want to use it to uh, uh, go back to uh, what we were talking before about the, uh, um, the the deploying capital and the difficulties for you know uh, uh, the demographic we're talking about. So uh, uh, citing to say that all behaviors cannot create new ways, uh, my opinion and in the opinion of this panel is that uh, access to capital is part of the problem, but is derivative of particular mentality towards minority founders. So if we assume that venture capital system is created with that, men uh, with that mentality, and, and we are, you know, it's, it's proven, it's not, you know, it's definitely, we, we see it every day. Uh, uh, should we try to push for the change in the entire venture community and not just adding new vertical funds uh, like the Harlem Capital or, or a particular, you know, uh, very vertical funds uh, or just adding minority fund man uh, managers to existing funds? I, I know it can be a little, you know, uh, tricky, but I, I think that, as we said in, in our previous call, there's a systemic problem here. And I, I, I want to have your take on how to approach the systemic problem of the venture community. I think my answer would depend on what mood I'm in on any given day. And that can be, you know, 20 different moods in one day. I think there are times where I think, yeah, obviously, you know, everyone needs to have a seat at the, the main tables, but then also like the, these specialized funds are really important, um, led by folks who know their communities and know what they're capable of. And we probably need both. Um, but I will tell you that even now with the commitments that are coming out with funding or, hey, we want to diversify our staff. Well, are you, is your general partner going to be, you know, someone of color and someone from this community, or is it just going to be the analyst who's screening deals? Um, who's making the decisions? And right now I don't see a lot of shifting in who's making the decisions, whether that's philanthropically or in venture. And I think that needs to happen. Um, and so I think the solution, you know, that some folks have decided is, we're going to create our own funds. We're going to build our own wealth. I mean, this has just been going on in, throughout history, I think, for marginalized communities. Um, and that is why there's a tradition of entrepreneurship in those communities is the system isn't serving us. We have to create our own system and we have to create our own wealth that then we can then, you know, parcel out to our, our people. And so it's, it's a really long question. You know, um, City actually just put out a research report recently about the cost of structural racism to the U.S. economy. And I believe the figure was over the last 20 years, it's cost us $16 trillion. And if you were to eliminate all systemic racism, so housing, education, jobs, financial services, um, over the next five years, the U.S. economy could generate an additional $5 trillion in value. Um, so it is really a cost to everybody to have this you know, system not working for some. I would echo everything that Rashmi said and, and would also say that we also need more data. Um, you know, I think you know, even as a black fund manager, right? It, I'm still pushing up against a narrative that I can have my own data uh, as a researcher, but like I can't bring pitch book data because they don't track for race or I can't bring, you know, something else. So I think, you know, even that 16 trillion, I mean, I use that all the time. I'm like, y'all know what I mean, just because I think people don't have a sense of perspective. So I think data in terms of where there have been successes is, is important. I think data where there's been opportunity cost is important as well. Um, I, you know, I've, I have been on a rant um, on this Quibi thing. Uh, because we could have funded over 200,000 black entrepreneurs with that billion dollars based on the average PPP loan that went to a black founder. 
And, and that's just absolutely absurd. And so at some point in time, it has to be like, what are the successes? But recognizing we're not gonna get more successes unless we change our current behavior. We also have to really examine what have been the opportunity costs of dollars spent on any kind of program that have given to an entrepreneur, assuming there's a failure rate, but is that really worth it? And, and I think in the vein of impact, I think one of the reasons why, not just because I am one, but one of the reasons why we are so passionate about entrepreneurs of color is because there is inherent impact that is generated because most of them deeply care about their community. And so many of them are solving problems through for-profit business models, and most of them are creating jobs. I mean, with our 1863 entrepreneurs, we've created over 4,000 jobs just last year alone because that is baked into the DNA of a business. It is about creating community. It is about having a multiplier effect that is bigger than them themselves as an entrepreneur. And so I think there's also data-wise needs to be a way to capture those cultural competencies that are very unique within communities of color and how they create this outsized multiplier effect from wealth at a much larger level than just a bunch of individual LPs. I mean, just to, I, I don't want to just re recite everything you said, but they're really important points, right? Like building the, building your own table is important because it demonstrates the use case that it works. And when there isn't data to prove that the market exists, which we hear a lot about, like some of the folks that we were really excited about who are named finalists this year are working in markets that data doesn't exist in. It is just not counted. And there is a huge and important market it's a massive market. It's a very monetizable market. But if the data doesn't exist, it's really hard to prove that you can scale in that market. And so I, I think built, both building building a table, um, like Harlem Capital has done such an excellent job at like proving that there are so there's a huge pipeline of entrepreneurs that need to be invested in, and it would be a dumb business case to not. Um, alongside of using that data then to amplify to um, to VCs who are not looking at entrepreneurs of color that this is in fact a bad business deal on your part and you you are you are making poor decisions for the fund at large if you're not choosing to invest in folks like this so i think it's i think it's a dual sided solution here thank you thank you all cuz I, I think you guys framed uh, uh, very well uh, uh, one of the main steps that the ecosystem needs to do uh, needs to listen more and understand uh, uh, and, and start capitalize on uh, aggregating data that doesn't exist. Because if most of the decisions are based on that, we need that to make our decisions better. Okay. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, you know, that is definitely one of the, one of the points that the, the ecosystem at large needs to, needs to point. Um, I, I, I want to, you know, shift the conversation to uh, a, a little lighter question. Uh, uh, we are towards the end of, of our uh, nice conversation. So, um, and this is a question to all of you um, because, you know, it, it's now a, a buzzword that is it's very important. Uh, uh, the ESG, environmental, social, social and governance criteria, uh, helps better determine the future financial performance of companies. How important that is for your organization and for the companies that you approach, you invest or support? I can start, um, you know, it's, it's a big pillar of Citi's business um, and has been for several years. Um, and partly because we think there's money to be made in it, not, not just because we're being nice or moral, um, although it also helps to attract talent and you know we're always in a war for good talent um, but really there's there's money to be made in in addressing you know problems like climate change and thinking about broader equity in society um, and that's again a cost to the entire economy that we're just missing out on um, so it's it's pretty core i would agree i i think um you know, I, I'll take a slightly different take. I think in theory and practically from a financial perspective, it works. I think there are some, it has not to date had a very uh, great, perfect overlay to many entrepreneurs of color. Um, I, you know, I, I, in, in when we raise money, we talk about our impact and they go, hmm, that's not in the ES or the G. Uh, and I think part of that is the S is not really flushed out. And I think we do awesome on E. 
I think we're doing better on G, but from women, not people of color. And I think the S is just whatever fits in the goodwill of a company. So I, I hesitate. I think it is a great framework. Um, I think we need to do a little bit more digging on the framework. I think we need to make it slightly more culturally competent because I think there's nuances. We do a lot of work in Native with Native American entrepreneurs as well, and they are reflected nowhere on there uh, because social is what they are about. So I, I think it is a good starting framework. Uh, I think it's also great because it opens the door to institutional funders and helps bridge the gap in a conversation. Uh, but I think just in some of the details, we could do some tweaking in terms of what is really counted uh, because I think impact manifests itself differently in different communities. Thank you for that. So uh, we have a question from uh, one of our uh, attendees, uh, uh, Rochelle. She is uh, asking uh, to all of you, um, if uh, you guys know of any direct funding resources for specific for female uh, entrepreneurs, uh, and that maybe it's, it's a wider question that attached to what we talked about before about uh, uh, resources that are uh, out there. How uh, you know uh, how how can we you know uh, answer that question in a in a more actionable uh, way? Yeah, so there's probably a couple of different communities. I, I don't know the uh, ethnic makeup of, of, of Rochelle, um, but Hello Alice is an amazing community for women entrepreneurs. Um, New Voices uh, Foundation is an amazing community for women entrepreneurs of color. Um, unfortunately, the, the grant world is, is also very disaggregated, but there's lots of grant programs out there. So I would say to the extent you're willing to get a lot of newsletters in your inbox, um, I think there's many folks that are tracking them and there are some anecdotal Google sheets going around, but I'm not sure how accurate they are. Um, but I think get connected to some of the networks that are out there. Um, and then there's also, thank goodness, because of all this, a lot of lists of, of funds that invest in women and people of color and obviously city and many others pop up on that. Um, but I would just caution to go beyond the list and dig deeper just to make sure that it's a good fit. I would just really quickly add, you know, I think it's helpful when you're doing that research and then you go to those folks that you think are appropriate fit to be as specific as possible about what you're looking for. You know, if you're saying I'm looking for investment, how much, what form of investment, you know, what's your time horizon? It just helps. Again, if I'm not able to invest in you, it helps me think of who I know who could. Um, and it, it is helpful then to like have me help you. Um, so I think that, you know, Obviously, in the beginning, you're going to be looking at everything and asking a lot of questions. But as you actually get closer to making that ask, um, being specific and actually, you know, I've also seen a lot of founders who will come in and say, well, you know, we'll ask them, what are you looking for from us? And they'll say, well, we could, it could be two million or four million, like name an amount, you know, and if you need to overshoot it, overshoot it, right? The worst that's going to happen is someone's going to say no. Um, but I think that comes to the kind of being ready. It's like you're in the room and you just got to now, now it's your chance. And so knowing what your needs are and, and what kind of funder you want to work with is also very helpful. Do you want a grant? Um, and I think, you know, Erica mentioned like a lot of that will come back, come with reporting responsibilities. Um, do you want, you know, VC investment who is somebody who's going to join your board and potentially try and change a lot of things on your company? Um, or do you want this business to be your baby and you want to maintain control? And then maybe there's some other kind of financing. Like maybe you want to go talk to Melissa. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm in New York. There are lots of organizations that are specifically funding women entrepreneurs, folks who identify as women entrepreneurs. It's it, there are so many groups that, that are focused on just this. Nationally, I imagine there are. Like, I feel like look at SOCAP attendees. I would look through, I would just email them and ask for people that have who, have, who went last year or went to their virtual conference. Um, maybe it's already public. If it's not, it should be. And just go through and, and literally Google search every single one of them. There are lots of funders who are solely looking at this space. Um, SoGal comes to one, there, or comes to mind as one, but I, I'm sure there are many versions of SoGal out there. Um, and, and I'm sure there are also a lot of communities of, of folks who identify as women who are going to um, support each other as they build companies. And so lots of them are going to have resources around financial advisors, attorneys that are great with startup, like all of the stuff that you're going to start to piece together that isn't just financing. And this is to the point on preparedness. There's so many other parts to the puzzle that go into it that aren't just about money. 
Um, VC sounds sexy, so you raise it. Um, but like, there are so many other things that are way more sexy to build the business that actually are required and will make your company way sexier in the long run too. So I think finding other like-minded founders can also be really supportive in that way too, that, that funders might not be in that way. Yeah, to, to add to that, to more than add to highlight uh, what Erica just said, which was uh, uh, what Rashmi and, and Melissa said uh, before, it's critical before going to anybody to ask for help to really understand what you need, what kind of help you want. Be prepared about your venture. What are you trying to do? What problem are you trying to solve? Uh, uh, so doing, doing the, the groundwork you know, goes, goes a long way, shorten the time uh, uh, between contact and funding possibly. And also I, I think that that's a, a key point that should go always across uh, before sending that email or trying to, you know, to send that text or uh, that LinkedIn, you know, uh, message, be prepared, do your homework a lot and a lot, and then ask your friend if, if you're missing something, because that's, you know, uh, it, it will help, you know, every founder, every entrepreneur, everybody at the end, you know, so much, so much more. Uh, this was an incredibly interesting and, you know, conversation uh, and hopefully eye-opening, uh, uh, not just useful. Uh, what we learn here is that there's a problem to solve, a big one, but as a at large community, we have the strength and the resources to at least start working together in the right direction. And some of us, most of us are already doing it actively and, and proactively. Uh, I'd love to talk more about these in a in a future uh, panel, uh, but for now, please, Erica, Melissa, and Rashmi, I'd love for you to to give us like a, a last word, some food for thought, or you know, some actionable task, so we can all leave this conversation with that extra push to uh, work on what we need to change uh, as the ecosystem, you know, what our mindset, how we think about you know, uh, funding and impact and trying to move the needle in, in, the, in, in the right uh, direction. Um, I guess I, to the entrepreneurs, <clears throat> I would say, remember that finance is a management tool. It is not a means to an end. Um, and so just set yourself up well and not be all over the place, but be really clear what it's going to do for you. <clears throat> I think people get caught up in all this money and then nothing happens. So I just remember it's a management tool. It is not an end to itself. And then to anyone who's thinking about investing, I would say know that uh, investment is about risk tolerance and risk management. It's not about risk aversion. And so it is unrealistic to avoid risk in a certain category or a certain race or a certain gender for all the wrong reasons, at least without looking at the data. And, and I say that because I trust that the data will show uh, that we are able to perform uh, as well as, if not better, in some categories, and, and it's worth that risk. That's great advice. Um, my only advice, it's a non sequitur, but would just be to go vote. So just make sure you go vote. That's my advice. That was mine as well. <laughs> make sure you vote. I think, um, particularly if you're an entrepreneur, um, there's a clear difference, I think, in this election about who wants to support entrepreneurs and who doesn't. So you know, read up, you know, decide how you feel about the issues and what's good for you and your business and your communities and go vote. Thank you all again. Uh, thank you to all the attendees to this, you know, uh, interesting conversation. Thank you panelists, Erica, Rashmi and Melissa for everything you're doing uh, uh, and the effort you're putting to, you know, to, to, to change and to innovate. And uh, I'll hope to see you all soon in, uh, on another Impact State of Mind event. So stay safe, go vote and wear a mask. <laughs>